Welcome to the Gottesdienst crowd, where we foster confessional integrity, liturgical preservation, and preaching that doesn't stink. We believe that the historic liturgy of the divine service is more than mere cobwebs of antiquity, but it is a true treasure of the church to be dusted off and brought down from her attic to be enjoyed. So let's get dusting. Welcome back to the Godestine's Crowd. This is Jason Broughton, your host. Uh, today we have back with us David Ramirez. He is the pastor of St. Paul Lutheran Church in Union Grove, Wisconsin. Welcome back, Ramirez. Yeah, thanks for having me. Well, I had put out on the Twitters uh, that we were going to chat about the thing that exploded last week. <laughs> yes. <laughs> If you have been under a rock, maybe you don't know what we're talking about, but last week there was introduced, or I guess not introduced, but released the expected large catechism with annotations and contemporary applications. It is a book that's printed by CPH, but not produced, produced by the CTCR, along with um, about 70 authors, isn't it? And for for the contemporary applications, and what happened I mean, before we start going into kind of looking at the text itself? What happened? How did we get to the fireworks and the explosion? <laughs> yeah, um, so I'll, I'll try to give a, a short summary of the of the events, and um, basically, um, as 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 you actually I think informed me. Back at the 2016 convention, there were some resolutions about new resources or updating old resources, such as the synodical explanation of the small catechism, um, which, you know, I, I don't think we've ever talked about before on the podcast, but um, I, th th that's a whole nother issue in itself. Um, there's some controversy there, but there was also a resolution that encouraged um, the Synod to put out a new, uh, not version of the large catechism, but um, the large catechism, you, you know, standing alone uh, with, 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 I believe, I mean, did the resolution say with notes or something like that? Annota um, annotations? Just with, yeah, with explanations and, okay. um, uh, to be produced, uh, there were two resolutions, one in 2013 and then another one in 2016. Gotcha. And the purview kind of changed from the 2013 to the 2016, where it was originally under the auspices of the president of Synod, and then changed uh, to be kind of directed by uh, or under the authority of the office of the president and the seminary faculties. So it kind of with the CTCR kind of running the show. Okay. Well, so, um, so that resource did go into development. I don't pretend to be an expert on all the history of, of the project, but I mean, I do remember, um, over the last, especially six months, um, uh, maybe even a year, um, you know, notifications and publicity about the large catechism, um, with annotations coming out, I guess I just totally missed that there were going to be essays along with it. And frankly, I was kind of excited because mm -hmm. Luther, Luther is very kind of footloose and fancy free <laughs> in the large catechism. He, he kind of goes on rants here and then he says that, and he makes references uh, to things that are going on in his day and age that not everybody understands uh, in terms of, uh, of the context. Um, so I, I frankly was really looking forward to a, uh, a large catechism with annotations. Well, that is not how the project turned out. And I don't know why, but for some reason it was uh, changed or maybe originally conceived. I, I don't know. But for some reason, it, it was not what a lot of people were expecting in the sense that it wasn't just the large catechism with annotations, uh, notes, but also all of these essays. I mean, how many essays are there? Like, 70 or is it 70 authors 70 essays i obviously i haven't read all of them but um you know uh i i don't understand the criticism if you haven't read the whole book and studied it thoroughly you can't analyze it well uh, you only need to know that uh, one egg was rotten to reject an omelet so mm -hmm. i think that i think that uh 
that's kind of an unfair critique of the criticizers. But back yeah. to the point. The point is, is that just from uh, the start of this being released, I know a lot of people were wondering why, if the if the if the name large cat Luther's large catechism is splashed on the front, why is most of the book uh, not the large catechism? <laughs> I mean. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with essays on our confessional documents, but typically speaking, uh, when you produce something like uh, uh, you know the large catechism, uh, especially an annotated version, you don't include millions of essays. Of course, there's maybe a historical introduction, maybe a uh, you know uh, an, an essay or two. Uh, a few uh, uh, about its production or what it means, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. Um, kind of like the McCain edition of the of the Book of Concord, where right. there are some helpful essays there. Um, but the vast majority of the book is the Book of Concord. Um, mm -hmm. So again, uh, that was confusing to me uh, right off the bat uh, when I realized that. Uh, and, and I only realized that because, as you alluded to, there was... Uh, an explosion. There were fireworks and uh, about what was contained in the book. And one of the first things I thought was, well, I mean, wh why are there even these essays in it in the first place? It seems like a confused project. Uh, mm -hmm. um, it, it, it just, it seems like there's audience confusion. Um, there seems like there's purpose confusion. Uh, what is this book trying to be? Uh, who's it for? Um, you know, it, it seems like it's doing too many things at one time. I, I, I think it would have been much better. I mean, I'm armchair quarterbacking, but it just seems intrinsically or structurally that it would make a lot more sense to produce a large catechism with annotations. And if you want to produce a book of essays on the large catechism, awesome. That's great. I mean, yeah. people have been doing that for hundreds of years or whatever. I, I don't know how long, but a long time. <laughs> so yeah. I, I just, and and but of course the confusion isn't just there the confusion is a lot deeper and that's what we need to get into but first how did this confusion or this document turn into an explosion well i think credit should go where credit is due and that's mostly due to uh the lutheran twitterverse and um just very briefly i think it's interesting that um we've been through several phases or eras of Lutheran online uh, discussion. And mm -hmm. you remember way, way back, there was the Wittenberg Trail and uh, there, were, there were chat boards and stuff like that. Um, some of those still exist. Uh, LutherQuest, uh, 1999 it started. Um, uh, you got the tired old ALPB uh, forum, which uh, I mean, I don't, do people still go there? <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's the same old uh, ancient uh, uh, libs talking about the same old ancient problems. But, but then yeah. you have Wittenberg Trail, and then you have um, the blogosphere. I mean, you and I lived through the golden era of the Lutheran blogosphere. And yeah. it, I, frankly, it was kind of sad because there was kind of a multiplicity of, of voices and venues and places. And, and that all got some subsumed under Facebook. And mm -hmm. then there were the glory years of Lutheran Facebook. And um, that, uh, with the rise of big tech censorship, as they would say, uh, that really fell off. A lot of people left Facebook and Twitter has been around for a while, but frankly, Lutheran Twitter is, has always just been totally dwarfed by Lutheran Facebook, just in terms of yeah. numbers, discussion. I mean, I know that there's some people who really are into Lutheran, uh, Twitter, but to me, it's always been a sideshow. That's not, that's not a, uh, a, a criticism. I, I don't know, uh, Lutheran Twitterverse uh, near as well as I uh, know Lutheran Facebook world, mm -hmm. but um, it's just kind of a sideshow, uh, not not super important. Well, I think that that has changed uh, with this explosion, and um, mm -hmm. whether now Twitter will be the new thing, I don't know. I mean, considering demographics and who uses what platforms, I mean, Lutheran Facebook will probably always have the vast majority of Lutheran. Um, social media users for the f for the near future anyway. But this might be a real turning point because uh, there was all these Lutheran Twitter um, accounts that were that that so back on uh, 10 days ago, uh, 
the Kindle version of the large large catechism with annotations and essay, you know, contemporary applications, those, those essays that came out on uh, January 20th. And very soon that same day, again, I, I, I kind of stumbled upon this or somebody sent me a link. I, I you know, it was, uh, it was uh, incredible how fast this, this went out. And mm -hmm. I think that there's two reasons for that. Uh, Number one, um, it went out and got such big uh, play all around in the Missouri Senate and beyond, frankly, uh, that's an important point as well, is because uh, a couple of these uh, accounts on Twitter uh, documented some real uh, serious uh, red flags uh, inside the book. Mm -hmm. And um, some of these uh, in individuals are uh, anonymous accounts. So nobody knows who they are. And some of them are actual uh, people using their, their real name. Uh, I, I don't want to try to get into the, all the, into the weeds of who said what, when, where, and how, but I, I do think that the, the most decisive uh, thread, t Twitter thread that discussed this was uh, a, a young man who is using his real name, uh, uh, everyone thought he was an, an anonymous user, uh, but his name is Ryan Turnipseed. Um, no offense against the guy's last name. I'm not trying to uh, yeah. make fun of him, but I mean, it sounds like an anonymous account to me. So <laughs> <laughs> whatever. <laughs> so uh, I don't know. I've, I've never heard of any turnip seeds before, um, except the ones I plant. So uh, so anyway, this this uh, Ryan Turnipseed, who's a Missouri Synod layman, um, he uh, he kind of cataloged some real red flags in the book. And when I say that post went viral, I mean, incredible. Within uh, that first day, I, I, I mean, it was it was up into the, uh, you know, 100,000 mark or something like that yeah. of impressions. I know not, that doesn't mean everyone views it and reads it. But I mean, that that nothing like that's ever happened on Lutheran Twitter, uh, at least as far as I'm aware of. Um, mm -hmm. And so you, you've got that. And by like that next Monday, everyone was talking about it. Um, I I remember seeing it approaching the 300,000 mark. I don't know what it's at now, but that's just astounding numbers. And so, right. uh, like I said, credit where credit is due for raising the flag uh, or raising these, these warning flags. And so, uh, you know, this, uh, this guy turnip seed, and then um, lots of other people on Twitter, people who agreed with him, people who didn't agree with him, it just turned into an explosion, which didn't just was not contained to Twitter. But it was it was shared all over the place through email, Facebook, wherever, within a couple of days, everyone was talking about it, maybe not on Friday, but by Saturday, tons and tons of people were talking about this in all these different venues. And, um, and I think the second reason why everyone was talking about it was because you don't have to study a whole book to say, whoa, what did that person say? What is going on? Yeah. Who is writing in this book that's linked to our confessional document? I don't understand the criticism that, oh, if you haven't bought the book, read it for 15 weeks and carefully interacted with it, you can't cry foul. Of course you can. Um, and there were lots and lots of red flags, and we're going to get into that. So on one hand, you've got uh, the folks on Twitter spreading this and spreading the alarm, so to speak. And, um, you know, frankly, I'm really glad they did. Um, and then secondly, yeah. it explodes way beyond Twitter. And that's when uh, it it is not just a, uh, you know, raging fire off in the you know, ether world of social media, but because it wasn't just spread, but also there was real substance to the concerns and criticisms. Um, then by uh, not just Saturday, but then Sunday, and then also on Monday, everyone is talking about it. I happened to be at a circuit visitors retreat for North and South Wisconsin on Monday and Tuesday, the next Monday and Tuesday. And I tell you what, everybody there already knew about it. Everyone was talking yeah. about it. Everyone was concerned. Um, there were a few people that didn't know about it and said, what's going on? Well, they knew about it real fast because it was, it was the talk of the town. And so, um, again, while I said, I, 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 I do agree that a, a lot of credit for raising the alarm should go to uh, kind of Lutheran Twitterverse. At the same time, there is this take that's floating around um, 
by people who are upset that the book got pulled. And the take is this, it's, it's really absurd. Well, President Harrison got bullied or mobbed by these agitators. You know, um, I, I, I saw one ridiculous post that said, you know, uh, isn't it sad that, I'm loosely quoting, but isn't it sad that some 20 year old kid could whip up uh, all these people to, you know, uh, basically trick the the president of the Senate into into pulling a book. This is this is really unhealthy and bad. Well, this mm-hmm. take is bad for a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, and by the way, if 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 you don't know already, President Harrison on Monday evening at roughly seven thirty, I th- we we looked at the timestamp. I think it was seven thirty something. Um, he 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 told CPH to cease production and or cease distribution, and we'll talk about his reaction later. But um, the take that says that that some young kid whipped up a mob and 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 tricked or bullied Harrison into doing this it's just such a ridiculous take i mean number one yeah. it's factually inaccurate um that's not how it happened and it's not because i have secret information i can say that um it's not because i can read hearts and minds it's because it's obvious uh, you read Harrison's statement, and he obviously got tons and tons of letters or emails and lots of concerns and criticisms from a wide variety of places. And that's the other mm-hmm. part that needs to be pointed out, um, that folks that think that this is all just a tempest in a teapot or a Twitter mob mobbing, they want to say that it, they, they want to not acknowledge that this explosion on Twitter um, didn't radiate and genuine... A uh, heartfelt concern was the reaction, and and that's exactly what happened. I personally know dozens upon dozens of people who wrote to uh, the synodical president or their district presidents, or if they're laymen, their pastor. I mean, everyone saw this. Tons of people were concerned, and so if I personally know dozens and dozens of people who did this. I, I have to believe that this is no exaggeration. If anything, it's an underestimation to say that hundreds of letters were sent in expressing genuine concern and uh, what is going on. Um, and I think it's it's rather not just inaccurate, but dismissive of of that fact to to overlook that yes, all, all credit to the to the Twitter explosion for getting this in front of people's faces. Sometimes you need people uh, yelling about this stuff. Um, you know, hey, this is a problem. But at the same time, let's not be naive and not realize that this would have gone nowhere if it didn't resonate with literally thousands or hundreds of, of very concerned Missouri Synod pastors and laymen who yeah. then took the step to um, say, please, President Harrison, these are some serious concerns. What is going on? Uh, you know, th- th- this is, this is, uh, are, are we sure we know what's going on here? Like, this does not look good. And also it's very, uh, this horrible take is also very dismissive and frankly disrespectful to the synodical president, who I don't believe is above criticism, certainly, but the fact that he um, looked at all these letters and said, you know what? I'm going to own this and say that, you know, review is, is, is what I'm here to do. And I'm going to pause that did not. I mean, that certainly made him look bad in a lot of quarters. That was a risky gutsy move, but you know, I mean, in the world of sports, who wants the ball? You, you, do you know this quote? Um, no, I don't. Okay. Well, the one who wants to score. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, well, winners want the ball. Winners yeah. want the ball. You know, I mean, Michael Jordan doesn't s- stand there all bashful when you know Phil Jackson has drawn up the plan to to, to win the game. I mean, Larry Bird walks into the huddle and goes, "I'm going to be here. Get me the ball." Like that—that's just how it works. Winners want the ball. Um, you know, and and I gotta say, you know, I I've I, I mean, I'll I'll just be very blunt. There's been decisions in the Harrison administration that I have disagreed with. Um, sometimes I've been frustrated about it seems like uh, promoting confessional Lutheranism and making our synod, uh, uh, you know, solid and uh, orthodox and, and, and good. It seems sometimes like it's 
two steps forward and one step back and then three steps forward and two steps back or two steps forward and three steps back. Like I, I, I am, I am not a, uh, a fanboy, as they say about every decision of president Harrison's. However, credit where credit is due, not just the, the Twitter guys, not just the, the, everybody who sent it in. I mean, he owned that this was a mess at, at, at great risk. And he took the ball and he said, I'm going to look at this. Please have patience. Mm -hmm. I mean, isn't that what we always hear about from the, from the Sasa quote, you know, the sect can't wait, you know, the church can wait. Well, well, let's have the church wait. Hundreds of people are legitimately and genuinely concerned. So let the church wait while uh, the people who, who, who need to look this over again, can look it over again. So that, you know, those of us who got our hands on a, uh, a Kindle version can actually look at it. I don't think anybody or hardly anybody got hard copies. But anyway, I mean, w- if you have suspicion that there is poison in the pot, you don't say, well, the chef overlooked, uh, the chef oversaw all this. Let's just serve it up. You know, you, you just need to trust the process and that it's fine. No, we have legitimate suspicion that there's poison in the pot. Let's be careful. And again, credit where credit is due. Uh, Matt Harrison took the ball. And uh, he owned it and he wanted to deal with it. So good for him. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I. So I that's where say, we stand. We, we stand yeah. with it in pause for review. Yeah, that's where we stand. And first and foremost, I would say that what we need to do, um, anyone who's concerned about this, is that we need to pray that uh, President Harrison and also all of the people he talks to um, and gets advice from, uh, all the pastors and uh, laity who are looking this over, the CTCR, um, the uh, doctrinal review, anyone who is going to be further involved in this, we need to pray for them uh, to have wisdom and faithfulness and, uh, con- and, and, well, especially with President Harrison, continued boldness to take the bull by the horns. I mean, mm-hmm. let, let's be honest, you and I have certainly been critical of some decisions uh, in the Harrison and, you know, with the Harrison administration sure. about lacking, uh, you know, getting out ahead and getting out in front of a problem, you know, and not taking the bull by the horns. Let's, you, you mm-hmm. know, it seems from the outside anyway, that it's like, well, let's just wait, let's just wait, let's see what happens. And it's like, no, you, you gotta, you gotta go out and, and deal with this and you gotta be proactive. Well, you know what? I think this is proactive. So we, we, we need to pray for everybody, but pray for him uh, too, frankly. Yeah. So that's what happened. Um, you characterize it as a confused document. What's what's the anatomy of that confusion? <laughs> An anatomy of confu- uh, of a confusion. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's that, <laughs> that, that's a good uh, a good one for for those of our listeners who who don't know that reference. That's uh, a reference to Kurt Marquardt's famous book on the whole uh, lead up to. Seminex and the Battle for the Bible, uh, called an Anatomy of an Explosion, which was the uh, book written on that whole time period. And I'm glad you bring it up uh, and you st- say it that way because I really do. If this is an anatomy of a confusion, um, it's a multi-layered confusion or explosion or <laughs> whatever you want to call it. Um, and I do think that it has parallels. Uh, I don't pretend that this is as big of a deal as, as Seminex, but there are parallels in terms of the cultural context. And that is mm-hmm. that back then, it wasn't just about inerrancy. It was also about uh, the radical shifts in society in the 60s, the uncritical acceptance of not just um, uh, you, you know uh, higher critical methods of interpreting the Bible, uh, but also uh, the pervasive unionism, which had already been seeping into the Missouri Synod, uh, but you know an intensification of that, and then also bringing in lots of uh, ideas from the world, and I don't just mean from you, you know the generic world, but I mean uh, wicked and evil and pernicious ideas and frameworks and terminology that was so rampant. Mm-hmm. You read the Lutheran Witness during the '60s, and you'd be shocked. I mean, we sound like the ELCA. Not every article, yeah. not every person, but it's crazy. I mean, we almost did turn into the LCA. And if we actually, you know, showed the world that uh, Lost a, a denomination could actually take back its seminary and take back its leadership and, uh, y- you know, win back its its uh, its structures. I, I mean, I know that we, some people would say we want a battle, but we might lose the war. True enough. 
but we did win a battle and um that's something that we should thank god for and now i do think that there are parallels to the assault of wokeism or sjwism but behind it is the same humanistic uh marxist communistic whatever you want to call it but um that is seeping into every church body every institution everywhere in in our modern western world and beyond and we have to acknowledge that and that's the backdrop for a lot of these critiques an awareness of that and for all the talk that a lot of people say in the synod about well context matters context ma okay well context matters our context is is that uh you know the the communistic or marxist uh wokeism you know that uh that is infecting everything that we've seen institution after institution fall to um that's a real danger and and it is important for us to be on guard against that. And a lot of people see some pretty uh, clear terminology and red flags and other things in, in this document. But that's just one of the issues. There's, there's, there's a lot of things. Um, do you mind if we start out with something a little bit uh, less uh, problematic, but where there's just kind of some confusion uh, that I think, frankly, the authors did not intend? Yeah, I, let's do that. Okay. Um, so I guess my, uh, and, and again, these aren't just all critiques that I thought of, but I, I've heard so many critiques on so many different articles and um, essays in here, but one of them is, is just the lack of clarity um, in some of these articles. Um, the first article that I'd point you to is uh, an article called The Fifth Commandment, Lawful, Lethal Force by uh, Professor Joel Bierman of the St. Louis Seminary. And I'm going to say right up front, it's a great article. It's a great essay. It's really good. It's a, it's a, it's very well done. Except I think that there's uh, problems in the last paragraph, and um, I'm just gonna uh, point out two things uh, in it. Um, so in the last paragraph, uh, Professor Bierman talks about how um, you know there is a place for lethal force, but that that doesn't mean it's a license for any Christian to use the sword for any reason. Um, and then he says uh, unilaterally. And while I think I know what he means, I think that he means we shouldn't just do it without any consideration of the law and, um, you know, for selfish purposes. I mean, I don't think it's, uh, it's, it's careful enough in terms of, well, does that exclude self-defense? Because you can be a judge, uh, of your own cause in certain situations. You get attacked on, on the street and somebody uh, is, is firing a gun at you and you happen to be carrying a concealed uh, weapon and then you shoot back and you kill them. You don't have time to call the authorities, hey, is this a situation when I should defend myself or not? No, it, the situation itself by definition demands that. And uh, I, we've talked about this many, many times about self-defense yeah. and you know resistance theory. And I personally think that Bierman would probably agree with this stuff uh, that we're saying. I just think that there's a lack of clarity. Um, so later on, I'm going to skip over the other thing, but later on, he says this, lethal force, Luther consistently taught, is rightly used only by the one placed into the omt of authority in the state. Well, that can be understood correctly if he means by state, um, you know, he's talking about the two realms. So state on one side and church on the other. The Christian as Christian is never going to do this, but only someone who's been put into authority in the state. And if he means by that, that would include even people in the home, like uh, house father, house mother, um, you know, uh, those people. But if he means it by yeah. the three estates, then he's excluding people in the home which I have a hard time believing, but he talked about the two realms or the two kingdoms. And then he talks about the, uh, the three estates and I don't know what he's saying. And a lot of people could very legitimately get misled into thinking only properly ordained, uh, officers of the law or the peace or whatever can actually use lethal force, which I mean, self-defense is, is written into natural law and nature itself. I mean, that's just not even even really uh, uh, debatable. Um, so, and then the last sentence, it is never exercised for the sake of self, but always and only for the sake of the neighbor. I really wish he would have said, it's never exercised selfishly, because 
it almost again seems to exclude you can defend yourself. Um, so can you defend your family if someone's bursting into your house trying to murder them? But if you're by yourself, you can't. I, I don't know. I could see someone reading it that way, and that's not good. I mean, you can exercise lethal force for the sake of yourself, not just insofar as you are a protector and a provider, and you're really doing it for the sake of your wife and kids who you protect and provide for, but also God gave you life. We're supposed to honor that gift and protect that gift, just like we protect our health and our body in, in other ways. And mm -hmm. uh, so again, uh, the right or duty of self-defense is something that all the, the reformers acknowledged. Um, yeah. And uh, anyway. so would it, would a, would a flip side of, uh, of that particular thing is if it's wrong to take your own life, right? Self murder, suicide, yeah. uh, then as we're taught, you know, every commandment uh, in the negative has its opposite also commanded in the positive, um, that then it is right to defend your life. Yeah. And I mean, and again, here, I think he's totally correct to say not indiscriminately, right? You know, yeah. should you utilize lethal force, even in the pr preservation of your life? Well, I have a really strong suspicion that guy over there wants to murder me. Well, okay, but <laughs> you don't just go vigilante style killing people. So, I mean, I again, right. I think Bierman is trying to say what we're saying, but no offense against him. And with all due respect, I think it is lacking clarity. And, um, and then, uh, y you know, th then you've got this footnote after the sentence um, that the legitimate place for the use of the sword doesn't provide a scriptural foundation for a right to bear arms. And then he has this footnote talking about the Second Amendment. And he, you know, he says this is, you know, it flows from enlightenment thinking. And again, I'm like, uh, it's way more complicated than that. There's English common law in the background, which is way earlier than the Enlightenment. There's biblical mm -hmm. uh, uh, ideas and uh, and principles that go into the writing of the Constitution. I mean, if you talk to the founders or the framers of the Constitution, I mean, those guys are going to say, yeah, this stems from self-defense. And yeah, it's true. It also stems from an idea that uh, there's a certain point in time where you can resist and overthrow authorities. And, and some of that is uh, biblical and some of it is refer you know based on reformation thought and admittedly some of it is more enlightenment thinking but it's way more complex and but here's the deeper point in my mind why in the world why in the world would you put that as a footnote footnote mm -hmm. yeah on on such a touchy issue when it is way more complex and really near and dear to a lot of people on both sides and it's in a footnote and and justice is not done to it um again i know i'm armchair quarterbacking but i've had this happen to me before when i've tried to put something in a footnote because i just want it down and throw down the flag and very helpfully uh, a friend or an editor or somebody will say listen don't don't do that uh, if you're going to bring that up do it justice, maybe in a different essay. Maybe, maybe mm -hmm. you know, maybe you do it somewhere else. May, may, you know, or bring it in and give it a paragraph or two. You know, do it justice. And I just think, uh, again, this is a small uh, point, uh, but I, I just don't understand why there wasn't way more clarity on the self-defense issue. Uh, I don't even understand totally what he's saying but i just assume that he, he 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 isn't denying the duty to defend yourself and then with this footnote I, why is it there what what why not expand it or just cut it out uh it may seem like just i'm majoring in minors but i think it's kind of uh representative of that this this project or how it came to fruition just was not pulled off with with the most care and it will, it will cause confusion. If someone reads this, they're going to be confused or they're going to go uh, on the wrong way on this particular point. Yeah. And, and that kind of lack of clarity re re revolving around our confessional documents is not the point of our confessional documents. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So um, um, other instances of lack of clarity. 
Yeah, um, there's another one. Again, one, one that's uh, a smaller one. <clears throat> but uh, I think, again, it, it, it shows that lack of clarity. And that's one by um, uh, Rick Serena, uh, Pastor mm-hmm. Rick Serena. And that one is under creation. God as creator. Yeah, God as creator by, um, by Rick Serena. And here, um, I think that, you know, what we, what we should recognize up front is I am, you know, sure that Rick Serena does not deny six day creation or a young earth or anything like that. So, um, yeah, so he makes a statement that I don't believe is very helpful in here. He writes, uh, like the creeds, Genesis has no interest in scientific theories. Now, that on its face, I don't think is what I'll say a wise sentence. I think it is uh, not accurate. Um, mm-hmm. Now, I know what he means to say because he says it in the next uh, sentence. Uh, it does not seek to explain in scientific detail how God made all things. And that's true. Genesis isn't mm-hmm. a, a, a comprehensive science book but rather that he made all things by his almighty word and what that means for how we view the world and everything in it. Okay, fair enough. If that's his point, which it is, because later on near the near the end of his essay, he says, I'm loosely quoting, um, if we reduce the doctrine of creation just to, uh, you know, scientific theories or theories about creation, then, then we're missing the bigger p- picture and the deeper meaning. That's great. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I know what he's saying, but I do I really think that it is unhelpful and unwise to say what he said, like the creeds, Genesis has no interest in scientific theories. That's, that's just not the case. I mean, now again, it's not a scientific textbook, but because it is recording history and facts, which bear upon scientific facts, then because it is, it is passing along uh, information in, in such a way that is going to naturally exclude some scientific theories. So in that sense, it, it does have interest in that. That's why we can say evolution does not work with the Bible. Um, it is explicitly um, excluded based upon what Moses tells us on about how God created. Yeah, we don't get every specific detail of how God created, but the details we do get exclude evolution, which Serena totally would agree with. Um, But I just don't think it's a wise way to say it, especially when the problem, and this gets to a bigger issue, the problem in the world, as we were talking about earlier, um, is, uh, you know, not, hey, let's only focus on creation science. Let's only focus Mm -hmm. on that. I mean, who actually believes that? I don't know a single person who says, let's only talk about creation science and not the theological applications. Why would we even pit the two against each other? Um, that's kind of silly. And so I think the danger being, as Serena acknowledges, uh, uh, there is a danger of evolutionary thought, Darwinistic uh, theories, um, millions and billions of years, You know, people who have all this old age nonsense or old earth nonsense. Um, why, why say it like this? I don't yeah. think it's wise. Yeah. And, and in, in that regard, he is, um, it, it seems like in, in the, the entire article, he's, as the creeds do, you know, arguing about or arguing for, um, for, the, for the person who needs to know and understand that the created material and the material world around us is, is important and is created and made and sustained by God himself, that we are, um, on the one hand, not only materialists, but uh, we are at the bare minimum um, materialists insofar as we are not Gnostic, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so he's he, he's making kind of that, that double point that we are materialists, um, but also, um, not only materialists. Yeah. 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 I, I, I mean, again, I, I think the Serena essay is, is good. It, it's a good yeah. essay. Um, you know, yeah. and, and I think it just needs to have that line deleted, <laughs> frankly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I mean, I would bring up another line in his that I think 
could be rephrased or deleted when he's talking about the goodness of the of the created material of the world around us including we ourselves that if we deny the goodness of that created material then we risk denying that our lives and our bodies and he's going to put all of these into couplets our skin tone presumably you know our nationality and our physical appearance appearance our sexuality and our gender and here i think he'd be better just to say uh are are being men and are being wo- women or our sexuality our maleness and our femaleness uh, yeah. something like that would be far better because this kind of would lead us into uh, away from just the lack of clarity but also to you know the taking up the the terms and framework of the world the 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 biblical account doesn't have gender as a terminology and while he is clearly arguing against it um it could lay open the 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 way f- in which gender talk could weasel its way into the way we discuss creation yeah and, i mean go ahead and then beginning to think that uh, somehow God created me with this gender dysphoria or uh, other such things, which of course Serena rejects. And um, but but I think your point is is well made that we've got to be careful with our language and not slip into or uncritically accept terminology or frameworks that are foreign and anti-biblical. Um, yeah, and which I mean, again, obviously Serena is gonna totally be on the same page as everybody in the Missouri Senate or hopefully everybody in the Missouri Senate about stuff like that. But yeah. Well, speaking of uncritically taking on terms, do you mind if I move on to another one? Uh, Please do. Okay. So um, I'd like to move on to the uh, Leopoldo Sanchez article. Um, Mm -hmm. That's, that's, that's a, it's entitled the commandments and social justice. Well, um, so if you notice, the term social justice is in the title. And then even in his first line, he says, more than a unifying theory, the term social justice, and he put it in quotation marks, encompasses a variety of ideas about the causes and costs of injustices in society, uh, especially those affecting disadvantaged uh, neighbors, um, as well as proposals to promote a greater measure of justice for all in society. So um, a couple things. First of all, the term social justice, it does not come out of a vacuum. I mean, the term justice is incredibly biblical and incredibly important. But when we use terminology, we have to understand, again, the context. And the context is, is that the people talking about social justice are totally wrapped up in, uh, and I'm talking about on the public square, I can't see into Leopoldo Sanchez's heart, uh, or Professor Sanchez, he's also a professor at the St. Louis Seminary. Um, I can't see into his heart. I don't know all of his intents or intentions here. Um, but my criticism is, is th- those concerns are immaterial in the sense that he's using a term in a teaching document connected to the large catechism that he doesn't really define as against what the world uses as. Because I assume according to the Eighth Commandment, he does not agree with how the social justice warriors are using the term, how the leftists and the Marxists are using that term. Um, So I don't understand why, if you're going to use that term, why you don't actually define it carefully and not just in abstracto, but define it very uh, and make distinctions between how others use it and how you're using it. Now, again, maybe he does this in other documents, but that's not the point. I mean, that's like when people say, oh, well, uh, that's explained in the book, not in the movie. Well, I'm talking about the movie. That's what I want to go see. And (laughs) so too, here's the article. Here's the essay. Uh, It needs to be explained here because this was being publicized for everybody to get and run out and all that kind of stuff. But then again, they said it was only for pastors and teachers. Again, audience confusion. So, yes. yeah, so social justice isn't defined. And then there's this very bizarre term, uh, disadvantaged neighbors. Disadvantaged by whom? You know, again, whoever talks like that, the Bible talks about 
people who are in vulnerable situations as the poor, widows, orphans, sojourners, you know, uh, the sick, lepers. They talk about reality. This is the reality of this person's situation. Disadvantaged mm -hmm. neighbors. I mean, again, why are we taking on the terminology and the vocabulary of the left? Because that's what it is. You, you, you don't find this in the church, church's history. You don't find, the, because again, someone might say, well, you have this concept. Yeah, fine, but terms matter. And that's how Satan works. Satan subverts language, destroys language, and we got to be on our guard. Uh, that's why I don't think we're just picking at nits. Disadvantaged neighbors. Why, why would we say it like that? You, some people may think I'm making a mountain out of a molehill, but that's why uh, good, faithful Lutheran parish pastors and uh, laity, they saw these terms and, you know, they are beleaguered in their lives in the world with woke, uh, woke, wokeism, um, social justice, uh, and every, all, all the other uh, crazy things happening in our world and having it rammed down their throat, having it rammed down their throat in, in, uh, at work and, at, and in their kids' schools. And now they open up a book from their own church's publishing house and all the same buzzwords are there. And I don't see responsible distinctions being made of saying, hey, we, this term is worth using and here's why. I know it's used bad over here, but this is how we're going to use it. And I mean, there are terms that are that need saving and there's terms that that are that are just destroyed by 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 the context uh, or the culture yeah and then there's other terms that why in the world would we use it it was made up by the world why why would we use it what, you know why why would we use the word social justice and even if you want to make an argument for that you better be clear about what you mean and what you don't mean yeah and and that's really the point because it raises the question doesn't it yeah. why are you using this <laughs> Yeah. And again, I don't want to impute stuff or pretend I have secret knowledge of, of, of Sanchez's or a lot of other people's intent or, or heart. And that's yeah. why my criticism is why, why, why did you do this in the first place? Maybe you got good reasons. Maybe you have bad reasons. Maybe you have uh, unclear reasons. Maybe it was just an uncritical acceptance of the term. Maybe you think it is a good term. Mm -hmm. Well, then make the argument. But what I don't like is people saying, oh, everyone's just freaking out if they'd actually read the context and read the essay. Wait a second. You're telling me that the world and the devil is jamming all this crazy stuff down our throats 24-7, you know, a whole host of avenues. And you're telling me that I, I'm not allowed or it's disrespectful or bad to actually say, hey, uh, this don't smell right. Or why are we doing this? You know, um, that mm -hmm. it. It just doesn't make a lot, a lot of sense. So again, I, yeah, it, this it doesn't pass in, the smell test. Doesn't pass the smell test. Yeah, yeah. And again, that, yeah. I mean, I'm just repeating myself. But I, I think another example would be helpful, frankly, if you don't mind. No, that'd be great. Uh, I think uh, we were going to talk about um, uh, one of the fifth, the fifth commandment: commandment essays. hatred as murder. Yeah, yeah, hatred as murder by. Uh, Warren uh, Malug Latimer. Um, so again, a lot of the stuff in here is great. Um, however, he uh, chooses, and you, you got to choose examples of hatred and how that's murdering your neighbor in your heart. All well and good. Okay. Even though this is kind of a side note, but um, I, I see a lot of talk about, you know, anger being bad. I wish um, we would talk more in the church about righteous anger because it exists. And I know mm -hmm. you and I have talked about this before, but the one uh, uh, example of hate that he brings up is racism. Here again, this is a term that is not in the Bible. That doesn't mean terms not found in the Bible can't be used. I mean, Trinity isn't in the Bible either, right? At the same time, though, um, if you're going to use a term, you better define it. You better be clear. Um, you know, speaking of the Trinity, when our forefathers and heroes of the faith uh, were explaining the Trinity, especially over and against Arian, uh, Arius and Arianism, uh, 
they did use some terminology. For, uh, they brought it over from Greek, uh, the, the Greek philosophical tradition, but they made sure to say, we mean this by this and not that. And yes, those Greeks said this, but that's not how we're using it. It's a good term. And, you know, they baptized it, so to speak. You know, this is a problem in the Missouri Synod, uh, all, all through lots of documents, uh, racism. Define it. Because to me, it's just like mm -hmm. kind of the slur of um, sexism. Well, most people who shriek the slur sexism just mean you're talking about the biblical distinction between men and women. I mean, it seems to me nine out of 10 times when somebody says someone else is racist, um, you know, well, what do you mean? Uh, how How is it racist or how is it hate? And what constitutes yeah. racism? I mean, you'd get tons of different definitions from tons of different people. And so I personally think the term is ridiculous um, and unhelpful. It's it's kind of useless. It doesn't mean anything anymore. Uh, if it ever yeah, well, meant anything. It sort of even goes against what he says later uh, in that same paragraph. While we can bite and devour one another, consumed by hateful rhetoric, the large catechism offers a more excellent way. I mean, the word and term racism today is used as a means to really silence anyone with whom you disagree. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. Absolutely. And and so so why would you use this as like in our context, why would you use this as the thing to point out about hateful rhetoric? <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it well again, uh it I I think it's uh, again an uncritical uh acceptance of uh, a term and a framework that that needs more careful attention to. And I think now, again, people may say this is a nitpick, but it's not. It proves the point where um, in one of the notes in Latimer's essay, number six, he capitalizes the word black and it's lowercase w for white, you know. Mm -hmm. Now, is this a big deal? Well, on its face, no. I mean, who cares? On the other hand, let's look at the context. Who does this? This is this is a, a new thing in the current year, uh, you know, according to New York Times style, right? And now it's spreading, right? Um, that you capitalize black and you uncapitalize or don't capitalize white. Now, mm -hmm. why would he use it that way? That, I, I don't know. I don't know. But it shows an uncritical acceptance or maybe it was the editors you know i should be fair maybe maybe latimer yeah. had them both capitalized maybe i'm both uncapitalized i don't know but somebody somebody did that purposefully or knowingly uh with intention or uncritically and my point is is that look at the context the context is is that uh you have a bunch of race baiting grifters out there who uh cry racism at everything from a Marxist framework and they, uh, uh, they, this is their new greatest thing. Why are we aping it? Because I guarantee you 10 years ago, if anyone asked the entire ministerium and laity of the Missouri Synod to sit down and over a huge gigantic megaphone said, write this sentence and, and the word, or the words white citizen and black citizen were both in it, you know, um, mm -hmm guess what? They'd probably not have either one capitalized. Or if they did capitalize one, they would almost certainly capitalize the other. My point is, is that this is not something that we should have, uh, I mean, in the church, period. Um, and it is something from the world, from the culture, and from some of the worst elements of the culture. And why do we have it in our catechism? It's so it's so silly. I mean, not the catechism proper, of course, but why yeah. why in this essay? It 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 just again it shows the point that there is an uncritical acceptance of the terminology in the frame. It's bad yeah. news. Who thought yeah, that was even, a good idea? Yeah, and even promoting then this idea of racial justice as opposed to just what God calls it, justice, taking yeah. on non-biblical, highly politicized language and terminology is is how the church and the authority of God's word is undermined. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Well, there's an article on the sixth commandment too, that does a little bit of this as well. 
Okay. Um, sexual purity. Yeah, sexual purity, and that is by, by Andrea Schmeling. Okay. Yes, this quote really got a lot of play, and um, I have no idea what to say about it. <laughs> I'll read it though. Um, okay. However, yeah. <laughs> so um, I mean, he's talking about lots of sin. She's talking about lots of sins, and and the fact that a woman is writing in this is obviously something we got to bring up later. But let's just pass over that for the book. Um, so she's she's saying that you know there's lots of sins that are bad. Okay, good. Um, However, though some of us are burdened with homosexual lust, pornographic addiction, transgenderism, pedophilia, and polyamory, more often they are the speck in our neighbor's eye rather than the log in our own. And then I, I think what follows, you know, her intention is, I think, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to explain this in the best way. Um, I think her intention is that she wants us to understand that it's not like um, it's only the homosexuals or the transgendered folks that are sinning. How did we even mm -hmm. get to this nonsense clown world? Well, she's not wrong. It is because we weren't uh, tough enough on fornication and um, adultery and a whole host of other heterosexual sins. Yeah. However, well, I mean, the, even this, the sin of how babies are born, or, you know, not recognizing that life comes from God. Yeah, exactly. And not right. What we decide. Or, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah I totally a, get it. Yeah, it's, it's a, a straight line slope. from, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a straight line from, uh, you know, contraception, abortion, all this other stuff. Boom, 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 boom. And here's divorce. where we are. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. No fault divorce, all this stuff. Yeah. So fair enough. If that's her point or part of her point, great. But it is. I'm sorry. Again, I, I, I assume she is a pious uh, Lutheran lame woman who is, uh, you know, she finds all these uh, deviant practices and behavior very, very um, uh, wicked. You know, I, yeah. I just assume it. But at the same time, um, I sense the spirit of all sins are the same. I mean, you know, yeah, we do need to worry about only pointing the finger and not realizing our own sin, but people, right. you know, bring that up when they want to minimize stuff. And I'm not saying she is, I'm saying though that I don't like the framework here at all. Um, some of us are burdened. Well, who burdened us with it? You know, I mean, again, it sounds like kind of that passive psychological, you've been burdened with this and tied into identity, right? You know, you yes. know, I'm defined by this ism or these behaviors. And it's like, um, no, you're not. And maybe God won't uh, totally uh, heal you in this life in the sense of uh, totally overcoming these desires and things like that. But maybe you will, actually. Maybe you can lead a regular, normal, married life. I don't know. But my point is, is that it, it's just, it, I, 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 I sense the spirit of all sins are the same. You know, and of course, in one sense, all sins are the same, but man, the Missouri Senate has been really bad about this uh, type of antinomianism of thinking all sins are the same. Yeah. And yes, they are, that all sins are damnable. All sins uh, break the entire law and render us judged, but they aren't all the same in terms of how much they hurt ourselves and how much uh, they hurt our relations with others. And there's a whole host of ways where they aren't the same. And again, think about all of us out here um, fighting every single movie producer, uh, almost every single school district, the entire media almost, pounding this perverted stuff down our throats and trying to groom our children and then, you know, being told that, <laughs> well, that's the speck of our neighbor's eye rather than the log in our own. You know what? Obviously, there's a time and a place to say, let's not be hypocrites. Let's not be Pharisees about this. You know what? That's not exactly all that needs to be said. And I know she condemns it and stuff like that. But how about a little bit of love for the victims, you know? And I don't mean just yeah. the person that's burdened with this stuff, you know? There's, there's, there's a way to say that and it be biblical. But, I mean, what about the fact that literally 
the 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 evil people who are in charge of so much of our country are literally allowing grooming of our children. I mean, it's sick. It's crazy. And then and then we're gonna read this. I mean, okay, we should be careful about everything, but I don't know. This just is a clanging gong in my book. I mean, it just it seems like the world's frame. It seems like a every sin is the same frame. Maybe I'm wrong, but I'm sorry. This reads bad. It is a total clunker. And I'm not alone in this. I, I don't know anyone who's read this and said, yeah, that's right on. That's great. Uh, I just, mm-hmm. I know, like, like here, here's another sentence. We shudder in disgust when it suits us, forgetting that we too follow our hearts, that organ which produces every evil thought and sexual immorality. Um, wait a second. It, I, 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 are we not supposed to shudder in disgust about pedophilia? You know, I mean, we should shudder. In, I mean, she should have said we should also shudder in disgust about adultery and about yes. um, the more common things. That's what she should have said. It almost seems like, well, we shouldn't be Pharisees and we shouldn't shudder about disgust. But again, this is my reaction, but it's a very common one. And I think it reflects the the, the tone of the paragraph. Why would we ever want to minimize anybody's disgust of any of this stuff? That's crazy. Doesn't make sense. Who thought yeah. this was a good idea? That that's that's what I don't get. I'm with you, man. It <laughs> it it reads to me that uh, as you said, uh, all sins are the same, and uh, how dare you judge? And yeah. uh, you know, don't forget that when you point fingers, I mean, she you've got condemn. three. Yes, but you know that passage from Matthew seven is the world's favorite passage against us. I know. I know. I know. And, and so, I mean, just not that it can't be used or that it can't be used rightly, but uh, so considering how it's always used, it seems as though it's being used in the same way. And now I know that she condemns it elsewhere, but it has that feel to it. And when you're writing for general commentary, you have to take that into example, right? We're trying to keep the context, so should they, the context in which we will hear it and read it and understand it. Um, So the burden of proof is on both, it is, is on the author just as much as it is on the reader to put the best construction. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and, and I, and I think a term that you're you're describing is situational awareness. And I think that a, a lot of the essays or maybe not even the whole essay, but like a lot of the sentences and things that we're pointing out just really lacks a good situational awareness. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the last bit that we're going to go to for taking on the framework or the thinking of the world is still in the commandments under the ninth and 10th commandments, justice for all exemptions for none by John Nunez. Yep. And and here, you know, there's nothing that really pops out immediately, except he has this one footnote that kind of drives me batty. Okay. And which which one? It's footnote 23. And okay. it it says, since the majority of this planet's citizens, some 85%, are from the races and ethnicities Americans refer to as minorities, I use quotation marks to call into question the term. Perhaps a more accurate word is minoritized. So in other words, every time we see minority in this piece, we are to take that footnote into into consideration that somehow they have been wronged with regard to um, stealing or, you know, sophisticated ways of taking their money or their property or other such yeah. things. And, and then the example that he uses, it only goes one way. It only goes to the inner city, to those uh, wronged by the yuppies of this world. He talks about gentrification only. Uh, he doesn't talk about any other side of the same problems that Luther brings up when he says that the law favors the watchful. So while maybe I would agree 
that there's a problem with gentrification, uh, where are the other issues? And so it seems one-sided and it seems, granted, it could be the side he knows. And so he's going to um, unfold that. But you'd think at least others would be mentioned. And so how are they being minoritized? And are are the people in the inner city the only ones that the law favors the watchful for or doesn't favor them? I, I just I just have a hard time believing that, especially as I look at those affected in the Dakotas area when oil was being retrieved from those back in oil fields and people lost their homes that they had paid for, like they didn't owe anything to to the bank on it, but because the land increased in value, so did their state and local property taxes. They couldn't keep up with it. Uh, we have people fleeing Illinois because of this. They can't afford their homes anymore because of the state and local property taxes. So this is not the only issue, right? Uh, it is a complicated issue. But why only the one-sided? It, it it seems as though it's a straw man to me. Yeah, no, I mean, um, I I I think uh, to be fair, I think that he probably brings it up because you know he he it's a situation or an issue that he's familiar with, and fair enough. I mean, that's what we all do. We go to examples that we we understand. But I think that you know um, your point of why is it this issue seen in the context of some other points in the essay and then the book as a whole, why is it when we hear uh, about examples that they so closely line up with precisely what the left is concerned about in the world? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, uh, gentrification. This is uh, one aspect of the broader concerns about population replacement, right? You know? Mm -hmm. um, but again, there's lots of examples of that. Um, I, I think that uh, it is unfortunate and not helpful to, again, consistently use examples that are also main talking points of the left. It naturally is going to raise suspicion of, well, what do you mean by this? And, and you know, how is this different than, than, than the leftist concerns about it? Okay, m maybe you bring it into a biblical framework, but you, you got to show that. And you also got to critique the people that you need to put some distance between yourself and. Um, so a, another example in the in the text of this essay, uh, Nunez writes, uh, well-networked individuals often collude in financial deals through relationships. Yeah, that's totally true. Um, for example, in our context, quote unquote, minority business owners or newcomers in the United States might be excluded because of an inequity of connectedness. Now, I find this example <laughs> kind of amusing, like not ha-ha funny, but more gallows humor, because uh, I I don't know what situations he's thinking about, but it's written into lots of codes and lots of federal programs. Who is advantaged, actually, by law <laughs> or code, you know, by the bureaucracy? It certainly is, 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 is it, it, you know, not that white males are the ones who are discriminated for. Uh, I mean, around here in Wisconsin, I mean, if one of my prisoners read this, they'd just laugh because they would say, uh, yeah, that's why it's 10 times harder for a uh, somebody born and raised right here in Southeast Wisconsin to open up a you know gas station or a liquor store um, uh, than someone who is literally not a native son of this country. And that's crazy. That's crazy uh, to favor those who are not actually your people and the people whose parents and grandparents and great grandparents settled the land. I mean, that's insane. That's so backwards. I mean, we obviously do uh, have, uh, you know, a, a, a code where people get extra federal grants and startup money and stuff like that. I mean, it's, it's that's why there's tons of uh, folks that are from India running all these businesses around in Southeast Wisconsin. Yeah, I mean, it, it's not like I 
uh, disapprove of an Indian man owning a, <laughs> a gas station. But to say that, oh, well, the minoritized uh, are excluded uh, because they're not as connected. Well, no, they're connected with each other, and they also get extra handouts from the government over and against the native population. I mean, I think Aristotle had a few things to say about this. It's crazy. I mean, what world is, uh, is, this, is this kind of sentence coming from? Uh, I, I don't think it makes a lot of sense. Um, so anyway, again, why are all these talking points, talking points to the left? It is a confusion. That's the problem, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Um, I guess one other thing that I, I have to bring up about um, asking Nunez to write this and allowing him or inviting him to write on this topic, I, I mean, I'm sorry to say, but who thought that was a good idea? I don't know John Nunez very well. Um, I think we've met a couple times. Um, you know, I'm not going to try and read into his heart, but I got to say, I thought he made some seriously unwise decisions in regards to um, the events of the last couple years. I mean, uh, marching with BLM signs uh, mm -hmm. back during the summer of 2020. I mean, he uses all the buzzwords for social justice in a multitude of contexts. I mean, the woke stuff that was going on at uh, Concordia Bronxville or Concordia, New York. Um, th I mean, no offense to him. Uh, I'm sure he believes and teaches a lot of good, proper things. But I'll say it bluntly, he is not someone anywhere near the top of my list that I would give this essay to um, uh, because of his you know, involvements with movements and organizations that are just bad news. I mean, BLM is bad, 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 bad news. I mean, and all this fancy uh, trying to uh, make distinctions between the movement and the and and the organization just doesn't hold. I mean, BLM uh, as a movement or as and as an organization, it, it's very intertwined. I mean, uh, people, uh, you know, raising fists and looting and burning and just doing all these, all, I mean, that summer was just horrible with the riots. To even mm -hmm. get anywhere near identifying with, uh, you know, such behavior and such people, th that is not wise, to put it very, very. On top of that, as you've mentioned before, they keep telling us to read these things in context. Yeah. So what context, how far back do we go? Yeah. What, what sort of context is involved in here? Because it seems as though if you take all of those events into context, there's an ax to grind. And it's not necessarily what Luther is talking about in the, small, in the large catechism. Yeah, well, it, it certainly is way more multifaceted than, than just pointing out that minorities don't have the same opportunities because they're not as connected, which isn't even true. And if anything, it's the opposite these days. And mm -hmm. was it ever true? And frankly, I mean, should people that come into someone else's country get all the same rights and privileges automatically as native born sons? I mean, not according to the Bible, honestly, not according to the Old mm -hmm. Testament. We are to um, favor our own, not like in an unjust or wicked or evil way. We're to be neighborly to everyone. But I mean, God makes it very clear that um, non-Israelites don't have the same rights and privileges unless they're actually incorporated into the congregation of Israel, you know? Yeah. And I don't mean that, like, purely religiously, but, like, brought in. Like, you couldn't own land. And that's not just because Israel is, like, a unique thing once and forever. That was the practice of everyone where, uh, yes, there was always the sojourner. There was always, you know... Uh, people coming here and there. I mean, uh, you see in the book of Ruth, they sojourn over in Moab and they should be treated uh, fairly and with respect. Um, but that doesn't mean that they just get to come on into a society and have all the same privileges as everybody else. I mean, what, what, why shouldn't we want to help our own? Why shouldn't we want to say, no, if anyone's going to receive aid and benefit to start a business, it shouldn't just be open to anyone in the world. 
I mean, who runs a country like that? That's ridiculous. Uh, th- it, it should be someone who, who's, who's here, our sons and our daughters and our, and our neighbors and, and whatnot. Um, I don't expect to go to India and, and get handouts from the government to start a business. I mean, I think I, I'm pretty sure the left would call that something like colonization. <laughs> you know. All right. So that kind of wraps up Nunez, right? Or did you have another point there? No, I, I really don't. I mean, you know, it, I, I just, I, I think that it's just another example of why, you know, why are we taking on all these talking? Yeah. Okay. All right. So we've covered uh, in our anatomy of a confusion, we've covered the lack <laughs> of clarity, the taking on the terms and framework of the world itself, um, using non-biblical, highly politicized language without explanation. Um, the last thing you said is authorship, um, that, and that there are two things within authorship that that uh, bring about confusion. Yeah, and I'm not going to just say bring about confusion, but just plain bad. Okay. Totally inappropriate. Um so again, this also has to do with audience confusion. I mean, back until you know, back in the old days of like you know, ten years ago, or I mean, I'm I'm joking around, but I mean, just in very recent history, it was well understood in the Missouri Synod and in the Church at large, if you go back further, that who should publicly preach and teach um, with authority um, in the Church of God? Well, um, the pastors, you know, right, and. Uh, and also the way that Paul frames his argument about this, it does have to do with you being a man or a woman. And so in mm-hmm. the Missouri Synod, as in the church in general, from time all the way back to the beginning of time, it was understood that while this doesn't forbid women teaching their children or, you know, the, the older ladies teaching the younger ladies, and that doesn't mean Bible class. <laughs> I mean, that's talking about, hey, this is how you can run your house better. This is how you can, you know, uh, love your family. This is how you can do this. This is, I mean, and some of those conversations would become very uh, deep and theological, but it's not talking about official, authoritative preaching and teaching uh, in the Church of God or anywhere in general. Um, and so you, you see this with the prophetesses, right? Um, you see how they how they go out of their way to show deference to those who should show, should have deference, you know, going, you know, they, they, they go, you know, they, they give their prophecy in their home, you know, in the early church, right. it, women ha- are given some of these gifts of prophecy. Um, you know, your, your young men shall dream dreams and all, all that kind of stuff that's talked about in acts as signs that the new Testament church indeed is the church that has been um, sent out by Jesus Christ, who is the true Messiah. But that's different than authoritative teaching in the church. And so, you know, some people say, well, I mean, how, how can we, how can we tell what's right and what's wrong and where are the lines and all this kind of stuff? I mean, you got us, Dean I think have been talking about this just a wee little bit recently. (laughs) Yes, we have. Thank you for calling attention to that. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, uh, I don't, I don't understand the confusion nor the delay. I think it's pretty obvious um, that uh, the church always had it right, that it's great yes. for women to teach their kids. It's great even for the congregation to band together um, and have women teaching the, the younger grades in Sunday mm-hmm. school, for instance. Um, I mean, I think it's, uh, frankly, I, I really don't care who I offend with this. I think it is weird if you have like a male teacher for you know four-year-olds that's weird i wouldn't like that i wouldn't like it at all that's weird that that's more of a motherly role now conversely i think once you get into the upper grades i mean you want lots of good male role models to this day most lutheran schools want a couple men on faculty precisely for that reason and not to just have an overly feminized school but anyway that that's Mm -hmm. besides the point The, the point is why in the world is any woman writing any essays in this book? You know, right. I mean, what what is this book about? Is it teaching little kids? Is it a woman giving her um, uh, kind of uh, personal uh, experience and, and recounting that about, you know, something that maybe other 
women can read and, and learn about her struggle or something like that. Maybe, you know, I'm just trying to think of appropriate ways and places that w- women would be writing uh, works, but they don't teach theology and they shouldn't be. They shouldn't be teaching theology. Um, uh, again, now some, some too clever by half person is thinking, well, aren't they teaching theology to their children? Yes, of course they are. And that's not what I mean. And that's what you know. I, you know that's not what I mean. What I mean is teaching with authority and having authority, as Paul says, over a man. I mean, Paul forbids mm-hmm. it. And so women writing <clears throat> theology books is bad news. Women writing, um, you know, articles in synod publications, uh, you know, explaining, you know, the creed or the Lord's Prayer, kind of like here in the large catechism. This is bad news. I, now, this is not a new problem. It's been going on a while in the Missouri Synod, but it didn't really get rampant until recently, uh, the last decade or so. And it is bad, bad news because we will not be blessed for breaking God's commands and the order, the beautiful order of his creation. So, this is not good, plain and simple. Um, mm-hmm. We've actually talked about what what one woman said or one of her articles, the Schmeling article, mm-hmm. right? Um, and so we actually delved into the substance. However, frankly, when I saw the table of contents, I, I was just kind of shocked and appalled at how many women were writing. That's not to try to say that they aren't good people or that they aren't pious or that they're stupid and don't know anything. That's not the point. The point is, is that this is not appropriate for them and men should lead. So either one thing, one of two things are true, that we, that we or someone is purposefully uh, wanting women to write um, and that's not good. Or B, there are just no men in the Missouri Senate to do it. And so like Deborah, they have to step up and treat us like, mo- or, you know, treat us like a mother would. You know, that's what Deborah yeah. says. I had to, I rose like a mother in Israel. So I don't really care what's true, or which which way is true or whatnot. I mean, I know which way is true. It's it's that people are promoting this and pushing it. Um, yeah. you, you know, so I, I don't really care about that debate. There, There's literally hundreds and thousands of uh, pastors that could be writing these articles. And also, I would point out, laymen, not... Uh, maybe writing some of like a historical piece or something like that. I mean, the, sometimes there are blurry lines. Sometimes we are on the seashore and sometimes uh, somebody who has a specific uh, insight in a collection of essays about history or apologetics or another uh, religion or something like that, and an expert in those fields, a, you know, bioethicist or something like that, you know, may, maybe a layman does write that. But first of all, that's not what these essays are. <laughs> and right. so it, it's like, who thought this was a good idea? Uh, first of all, it's inappropriate for a woman to write these essays just on its face. Second of all, I mean, many of these women have zero theological training. Not that I believe in the cult of experts or anything, but I mean, who thought this was a good idea? Why? It just doesn't make any sense. It makes no sense. I don't get it. I don't get it at all, unless we're going to devolve into some type of tokenism like the ELCA did, you know, oh, we got to have someone from this ethnic group and that ethnic group and this, and we got to have a woman do this and let's balance out the books and make sure everybody gets their piece of the pie. I mean, I literally lived through that going through the ELCA like wildfire and it's not good. And it's from the spirit of this Mm -hmm. world. So again, I can't accuse anybody and look into their hearts and say, you want to turn us into a tokenism place. Well, I don't know who who wants it and who doesn't and all the wherefores, but that's what's happening, and it's yeah. absurd. It's like watching someone stick a stick in their spokes of their bike, watching them fall <laughs> over and being like, "Boy, maybe that's a good idea," you know, and and yeah. doing the same thing. It is so crazy. Why yeah. would do this? I mean, what's next? Are we going to have quotas on committees and on board of directors? I mean, I hear this actually sometimes. Well, there's not enough um, women on a board, minoritized peoples, right? You know, <laughs> on, on this board or that board. It's like, oh, my goodness. You guys are, A, so lame because that was that was cool like 30, 40 years ago. So just like typical Missouri Synod trends, it's always a generation and a half behind. It's so lame, it's so outdated, and it's so obviously going to lead to bad things. So 
Yeah. yeah. I, I don't know what more you want me to say about the women authors thing. I think it's just absurd. I, I think it's ridiculous. Um, yeah. It's just so inappropriate. Well, and particularly uh, I, because we're getting a confused message on who this is for. On the one hand, yeah. it's for the laity. On the other hand, it's for professional church workers and pastors. So yeah, well, and that's the thing. It's kind of like a catch twenty two because we're because what I want to talk about next is the authors who are not part of our confession next, mm -hmm. and it's like you can't have it both ways. If this is a book for children or, or a book in which it's appropriate for women to write, um, which I, I yeah, that's just a mess, you know. But anyway, if it's that, then it can't be a, a oh, this is a very you know academic book, and that's why we have these outside voices from outside our confession. You, right. you can't have it both ways. Which way is it? I mean, I, I, I don't buy any of it at any time, but I mean, like, which way is it? Audience confusion. What is going on here? And I'm sorry to say, somebody. Uh, Somebody walks into a CPH bookstore, which do any of those even exist anymore? But somebody looks online and looks at this cover, Luther's Large Catechism. Well, I learned from the large, uh, from the small catechism. My pastors right. talked about the large catechism. Hmm. Oh, boy. With annotations? Well, I think that means notes because no offense against people, but mo most people don't know what annotations are, you know, um, or if they do, they just. They think, well, there's notes of some kind. It's helpful. You know, they don't think about it like that. I mean, that's very, it's more of like a uh, academic thing. Um, but what do people get drawn to? Your average person. Oh, large catechism and contemporary applications. Ooh. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, so even if it is, a, it is supposedly for pastors and teachers and professional church workers, it is going to be picked up by lots of, of laity. Yeah. I mean, and even if they don't pick it up, um, their pastors will be reading it. And if they're not discerning, they're going to be like, oh, I need to talk this way too. Well, yeah. praise be to God. A lot of pastors and at laity said, this don't smell right. Um, send it back. And yeah. praise be to God that it's being paused as Her past, uh, President Harrison did. Mm -hmm. But do you mind if I talk about the other authorship issue? Yeah, please do. Um, so the other issue is we've got, um, a handful of folks outside of our communion who are writing in this. Now I'm not going to go through one by one because it doesn't need to be done, um, in that way. But I, uh, I just want to note the principle and then a very, very egregious example of this that frankly has me way hotter and offended and i don't mean like you know i'm offended way but i mean like i truly am offended uh and and, and so in principle the the thing is is that why in the world in a book that is connected to a confessional document that's going to be teaching our people whether it's just the church workers or also the laity i i why would we go to people outside of our communion. Now, before anybody writes in with hate mail and says, oh, well, are you saying you can't learn from anyone outside of the Missouri Senate? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's exactly what it, give me a break. You know, <laughs> it, it, it's just so obnoxious when people are like, yeah, I caught you. Are you saying this? No, of course I'm not saying that. And you knew that, you knew it. You're just trying to score a point. It's dumb. And we all see how dumb it is too. Obviously, Someone who can think and someone who can make distinctions can say, hmm, introducing or discussing arguments of an author might be, in a, might be appropriate in some places and not in others. So could a, let's just throw out there, could a Roman Catholic theologian make a, a point about the, the book of Psalms that's really insightful? Um, yeah, absolutely. And so maybe um, one of our professors brings up that point and says, hey, guys, he's Roman Catholic, and you do the proper caveats, and you say, you know, he's not good on everything. Obviously, he's not part of our confession, but you know what? He makes an insightful point here. That, that's good for us understanding the Psalms. Uh, or maybe he's really, really, really uh, got a, an awesome point, and I know this happens at symposia sometimes. You know, you invite an outside scholar, somebody not from our communion. Okay, maybe in a setting like that, that makes sense. Um, I don't want to go off into the weeds of all, all the different possibilities, but in a book like this connected to one of our confessional documents, um, you know, 
widely, you know, publicized as like the end all be all of large catechism stuff. Why would we go hat in hand to people who are not in our communion to be teaching us? That's not arrogant. That's not arrogant. God has blessed the Missouri Synod with so much and uh, we should utilize it. I mean, it's, I mean, again, this is an example that, you know, I, I don't mean to be offensive by, um, but sometimes the Missouri Synod acts like the homely girl, you know, hoping for a prom date, you know, just yep. desperate, you know, just desperate. Who's, who's paying attention to me? Who's looking at me? Who's, oh, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's pathetic. And, 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 and frankly, why are we having people who we, we, we wouldn't commune with because they're heterodox and they teach against the word of God, teach us in this document and teach our people in this document. That makes right. no sense. And as someone pointed out to me, and now I can't even remember who, but who, whoever you are, I'm sorry, I'm not giving you, um, somebody pointed out the catechism is linked to our confession of faith, not just in the book of Concord, but, um, the catechisms are especially linked to um, us being faithful unto death. Um, the catechism is even mentioned in the confirmation, right? I know it's a small catechism, but the large catechism helps explain the small catechism. So <laughs> we've invited people who, um, you know, have sworn to be good followers of the catechism and to be faithful unto death. And yet they won't even leave absolutely heterodox church bodies. It, mm -hmm. it, it boggles the mind. Who thought this was a good idea? It does not make sense. Now, to be fair, there is a spectrum of people who are outside of our community that write in this book. And um, I, I'm not saying that, 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 that there isn't nuance to some of these uh, questions. And that's why I want to bring up the most egregious example. So first of all, there's, there's some NALC folks. I mean, I think it's silly. I mean, uh, I come out of the ELCA. I know you know that. I know a lot of people know that. Um, so I left and I came over to the Missouri Synod. And I think the NALC is just trying to turn back the clock to 30 years ago. I don't think it serves uh, much of a purpose on changing the fundamental problems of the ELCA. I know some people are a lot more hopeful and uh, they think that the NALC might come around on inerrancy and on uh, closed communion and women's ordination, a whole, whole host of other issues. I don't think that's very likely, but God bless them. I will give them mm -hmm. credit for this. They at least had the guts to leave. They at least had yeah. the guts to leave. They had the integrity to leave. You know, I disagree with the NALC on numerous issues. Again, I think institutionally and all that kind of stuff, I, I just, I don't buy the project, um, whatever. I, I think it's doomed to be a moderate, a moderately liberal synod you know i i just i don't believe in the project I, I just don't think it's wise but whatever my personal feelings or analysis aside i'll give them credit where credit is due they had the guts to walk out of the elca because they knew they couldn't stay there in good conscience because of the word of god now i would mm -hmm. say at the same point they're still hanging out with women pretending to be pastors and that's not cool either but neither here nor there. Let's just, let's leave it on a happy note. Right. So at least yeah. those guys had, had, had the guts to leave. Um, but they shouldn't be writing in our thing, but guess what? We even have an ELCA clergy person who's writing in our large catechism book, uh, mm -hmm. uh, professor Stephen Paulson. I've never met the man. I don't know the man. And guess what? I will admit, and I don't care who says what about anything. I didn't read his article. I didn't read it. You know what? Because I don't care what he has to say. Now, if somebody said, hey, Stephen Paulson made a really good point about this, that, or the other thing, blah, 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 and then some other book. Uh, yeah, okay, maybe I'll read it. Maybe I'll learn something, whatever. Um, I wouldn't be above that. Or I, it's not, Oh, he's in the LCI. I will never read him. That's not my point. However, it is so offensive that a guy who is in that sodomitic communion is actually writing in our large catechism book. And again, mm -hmm. if people are saying, oh, but I heard he's worshiping at a Missouri Synod church, or I heard that he's going to become NELC, or I heard I don't care. I don't care because it, it, that's not true yet. I purposely went to the ELCA clergy roster page and 
checked so I could say it with full accuracy. Stephen Paulson is still on their clergy roster. That's, mm-hmm. that's his communion. That's his public confession. And that's disgusting. It's gross. I mean, how could, well, not how could you, I'll state it more clearly. You can't be an Orthodox Lutheran man with integrity and be on the clergy roster of the ELCA. It's impossible. I mean, the ELCA has so many absurdly pagan things. I mean, I don't, I, they're not a Christian church body anymore. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying there's no Christians, uh, you know, in, inside that beyond heterodox, that syncretistic body. I'm not saying that. I don't know the state of people's souls. I can't see into their heart. But I tell you what, it's not a Christian church body. And it, yeah. it is just, it's a joke. I mean, it, mm-hmm. it is so filled with demonic teaching and Satan's work. I mean, I, I could just give you roll after roll after roll of, uh, of all of these horrible things. You know them. Everybody knows them. Yeah. And a guy who's but, public confession. But, uh, but those burdened with homosexual lust and pornographic <laughs> addiction and transgenderism and pedophilia and polyamory, more often, aren't they the speck in our neighbor's eye rather than the log in our Oh, own? man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, see, that's the thing. We, we've been we've been very uh, we've been very tempered in our uh, criticism of this book, and I think that's a good thing to do. But at a certain point, you just gotta you start flipping through this, you start reading it, and you're like, "Hey, these notes are awesome. This essay's, essay's great. This is good." And then you start going, "What a clunker! What? Why would? Yeah. We, we, what? Who thought this was a good idea? You know, like well, that's, well, that's what I want to post you now." The question okay. you've been asking the whole time. Yeah. Who thought this was a good idea? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I think that there's a lot of, you know, places that fingers could be pointed. I mean, yeah. Um, you definitely could point towards uh, the CTCR, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, did they actually read every word of this? I mean, Allegedly, uh, I mean, they did. I, I think that's the process. Again, I'm not an expert, but I don't know if they all read every word or they passed it out or whatever. I, I have no idea. But the point is, is that it was done under the auspices of the CTCR. Um, yes, in conjunction with the Office of the President, and I'll get there next. But yeah, I mean, man, what I mean, what was going through their heads on this? I don't get it. I don't get it. So I think this is a failure of the CTCR. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that it is... Oh, by the way, um, as uh, has been said all over social media, uh, CPH was not involved in the creation of this product. And so I think it's fair, it's it's right for us to point. A lot of people were blaming CPH uh, from from the beginning, and I guess that's inaccurate. I guess yeah. that they, they were just told, well, we're doing this and you need to print it. I'm simplifying it, but they did not yeah. have oversight or reviewal power um, to do anything about this. So I think we should be fair to CPH. So yeah, so there's mm-hmm. a CTCR and then, okay, there is the office of the president. I mentioned this earlier that, um, that Harrison uh, owned it, so to speak. Uh, he took ownership of this problem. He explicitly said, yeah, I'm the, I'm, I'm, I'm the chief doctrinal reviewer, you know? And so I, I really want to give credit where credit is due there. And yet at the same time, it went through the office of the president, and I don't know, uh, of course, how much he read or he didn't read. Um, but ultimately, I do think it was it was a bad move to send this through. Mm-hmm. Um, so those are two places where I think some some blame can be laid. Um, and again, I'm glad Harrison owned that. Uh, I mean, he he hasn't said whether he's going to let it continue or not, but I'm glad that he owned that, you know, he, he's the one who needs to take a look at. Yeah. And then, um, and then you've got the editors. So um, in any project that is that long, I mean, whatever review process, whatever CTCR procedures or people were, um, whatever, whoever got tasked by the president to, you know, look at it uh, through the office of the president and how much Matt Harrison uh, read carefully, you know what I mean? Like actually dug into and studied. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know any of those answers. But everybody knows that editors 
indeed shape a project like this. Mm -hmm. And you've got Larry Vogel. They drive it. Yeah, they drive it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, again, I can't say, well, so-and-so put this person on this essay, but I mean, that's what editors do, right? Will you write for this? Will you write for that? And let's shape the vision and shape. Yeah. Like you said, they drive it. So um, I think a lot of the, the blame should be laid at the foot of the editors. And, um, you know, uh, Larry Vogel, uh, I, I know a little bit, um, met him a couple of times, but don't know him super, super well. So I don't know. I don't have any insights on that. Um, just besides to say a lot of this lays at the foot editors. And before I kind of critique them, I should say there's a lot of good work done in this. And so I hope they sort this out and I hope we get all the good stuff. So, you know, congratulations for them to producing lots of good annotations and other stuff. The other editor is John Pless, uh, Professor Pless of the Fort Wayne Seminary. And I got to say that a lot of the authorship choices do, especially with my last critique about Paulson and the NALC guys, I don't know. I don't know who invited those guys. But what I do know is, is that those guys are guys that Plus hangs out with. Those are his friends. Mm -hmm. And I have learned so much from John Plus, and uh, he's done so many good things at the Fort Wayne Seminary. Uh, and it grieves me to say it, but I'll just say it. I do not understand this stuff. I do not understand why um, just because you are a theologian who is friends with John Pless and allegedly has good things to say, why you get to be in a heterodox synod or a non-Christian <laughs> synod and get to teach in the Missouri Synod. Yeah. I don't understand it. I don't think it's good. I don't think it's right. And frankly, I, I'm just sick and tired of these guys being pushed on our synod. I don't like it. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't think it's good. And yeah. I also don't like the commonality between not all of them, but many of them. And that is, is that they're disciples of Gerhard Ferdy, who mm -hmm. has been promoted by both seminaries um, in various ways and fashions over the last, you know, more than a decade now, more like 15, yeah. 20 years. I, this is indicative of a broader problem, which mm -hmm. now is not the time or place to, to delve into it, but it's been a concern of many people. It was a concern of Kurt Marquardt. He died of, of, the, of, of the reticence to talk about sanctification, um, about a creeping antinomianism. And mm -hmm. uh, again, I mean, I, I, we can't get into it in detail, but it saddens me that how in the world can we, you know, a generation and a half ago, be so clear about the dangers of Gerhard Ferdi and the denial of the third use of the law? And now a bunch of Ferdi disciples that aren't part of our communion are teaching the Missouri Synod in the large catechism's big edition. Yeah. That, that, that's crazy to me. Yeah. I mean, I, what would Kurt Marquardt I, say? <laughs> what would yeah, Robert I was, say? Uh, well, I was, um, you know, I was a student while you were there and learned a lot from Professor Pless and have a great deal of respect for him. Uh, but it, you, I just come back to, you know, to whom much has been given, much shall be required. And, you know, he's been given, uh, you know, a lot of, of, of good things to be used for the benefit of the Missouri Synod. And the standard that we should expect of him should be higher than this. Yeah, I um, think so too. Yeah. I mean, we were talking uh, earlier yesterday about this and, you know, would we, can you imagine Chemnitz inviting, you know, some of his adversaries to, to, to put in the formula of Concord? Hey, Rob. Hey Rob Bellarmine, could you uh, yeah. <laughs> give give me an essay on uh, you know some topic, the new obedience? I mean, he's a papist, <laughs> or no? Right. I mean, I mean the better example, which uh, which which I think you're alluding to that we talked about yesterday was was not just crossing confessional lines, but yeah, Chemnitz, or I would say even earlier, um, uh, 
you know, uh, the Nicio Lutherans, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the Nicio Lutherans in the height of the crypto Calvinistic and at a, at a, at controversies and all this stuff, right. You know, you got the Nicios and you got the Philippists and, and, um, for those of, uh, those of you who are listening that don't know that story, I mean, it was just really, really important. I mean, they were battling for the soul of, uh, Lutheranism, uh, and, and could you imagine them calling up the Nicios, the good guys, calling up the Philippists and saying, hey, you know, we're, we're thinking about doing a collection of essays. Uh, ha, how about we get a couple of Philippists to do this together with us? You know, <laughs> like what? Personnel is policy. Personnel yeah. is policy. And why? Why would you have this? And, and I'm sorry, I know I'm beating a dead horse, but like, I mean, Stephen Paulson. I mean, mm -hmm. I, it, it really, it, it is. I, I mean, <clears throat> maybe it sounds mean. I don't really care. Like, it disgusts me. I, yeah. I mean, like, like I said, I don't know the man, so I'm not saying it personally. But like, here's a guy who's literally in communion. He is in the communion that has uh, drag queens show up in services, that has uh, goddess worship, that is pro tranny homo, every deviancy under the sun. Uh, not to mention female pastors, denial of the Bible. I mean, just the full Monty of nonsense. You know mm -hmm. what we strive as regular parish pastors every single day to help our people and the rest of the world know that's not us wrong Lutherans, right? A man who's in communion, who doesn't have the integrity by definition to leave, to actually stand up and say, this is who I am. And I refuse to be a part of this. A man who doesn't mm -hmm. do that, you know, he's, he's going to, he's going to teach us on what he gets to write on the third commandment, the worship and the <laughs> word of God. What yeah. a ridiculous irony. Give me a break. I don't need to read it. I don't need yeah. to read it. It's just... All right, so, so finally, we're going to wrap this up. We're getting a Yeah, I know. I know. We're here. getting long. Um, yeah. Finally, where do we go from here? I mean, what should we be, what should we be hoping for? Well, I mean, as, as you really aptly put it, th this is kind of an anatomy of a confusion. And I think that the way to deal with this. Um, and I, I've got to believe other people have thought about this before. I'm sure it's not an idea unique to me. I think the way out of this is that um, or Harrison, the CTCR, wh whoever makes these decisions, somebody split split this book up. Let's, mm -hmm. I mean, I haven't looked at all the annotations, so I, I don't know whether there's good, if it's all good or bad. I mean, the stuff I read was good. I mean, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, it's a big, long document, but split it up. Do the large catechism with annotations, like I believe was the original product, project. Do that. Leave our confessional document alone, unburdened by all of these Lutheran witness articles that have weird authors and they don't mm -hmm. really fit with an academic work. Um and so let that come out, you know, historical essay or two, whatever. Do that and then take the time to look at these essays and separate the wheat from the chaff. Maybe some can be saved. Maybe some of those little unclear things can be cleaned up. Maybe some just need to be tossed, uh, like everything that was written by the female authors and the guys outside of our con frankly. That should just go. Yeah. But regardless yeah. of what you do, um, or if those essays are so, so important from these NALC guys, then then publish it in like a study document and study it somewhere away from me. I know I'm joking. <laughs> I mean, just but like, but like separate this stuff out because it's a confused project and maybe that's how it can be untangled. But I tell you okay. what, um, before, before we close, um, I really, I really think that we should, uh, we, we should read the statement that, that paused this um, because man, it was, it was, uh, it was a big deal. And yeah. uh, I, I want to, I want to make note of it. So um, let me get to it. Okay. Here it is. 
So a message from President Harrison. Grace and peace to you in Christ Jesus in light the, of the concerns raised. I have asked CPH to cease distribution of the new, large, the new annotated large catechism. This will allow us time to evaluate the comments and critiques received and revisit our doctrinal review process, which is my responsibility. There he owns it, you know. He's listened to the mm-hmm. concerns. He's gotten obviously tons and tons of comments and critiques, and he's taken up the ball. Good for him. We steadfastly proclaim Christ crucified with the forgiveness of sinners and stand forgiven and unafraid, committed to Christ Jesus and his inerrant scriptures to the fa- in the face of all cultural opposition. I really like that last part. You know, um, he, he, he preaches the gospel. Um, he talks about the forgiveness of sins. And that's why we can be unafraid. And he mentions the inerrant scriptures, which evokes, uh, I think, a parallel to the battle for the Bible. And in many ways, uh, we are also in such a cultural climate where we got to stand firm to keep our church. And mm-hmm. a lot of people are watching. And so I, I am glad that Harrison wrote this. And then he said, I ask for your patience. And we should give it to him, frankly. I don't know what he's going to do mm-hmm. with it. I don't know how he's going to untangle this mess. And he's going to need a lot of help uh, from a lot of other people. But um, you know what? He did a good thing. And we should pray for him. And uh, you know, I, I you know, I, I think of that Sasa quote um, again. I think about it. Uh, the church can be patient, right? The church is patient, yes. not like the sect that demands everything. And I think uh, Matt Moss pointed out that a couple pages earlier, paragraphs earlier, he says uh, we shouldn't be patient. Uh, I, I'm sorry, we should be impatient. Uh, we, we shouldn't be patient where we should be impatient. And we should be impatient about rooting out heresy. And, you know, I mean, even if uh, we're not saying that this document is like, oh, someone denied the Trinity in it, like heresy that way. At the same time, it's it's not a good document. It is a, a, a big, confusing mess, in my opinion. And so, you know what? I'm glad that now we can we can be patient. And uh, hopefully, even those who are upset about the church being careful and diligent and concerned about red flags, I hope they can be churchmanlike about it and be patient. And there's the anatomy of the confusion. Thank you, Ramirez, (laughs) for your time. And uh, look forward to chat with you again. Sounds good. 